Welcome to Human Rights Asia Weekly Roundup. In this week's program, a special report on labor rights issues in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and India. The Indonesian media misrepresents human rights campaign for West Papua. The Indian Supreme Court recriminalizes homosexuality in India. Stay with us for more on these issues. Welcome to Human Rights Asia Weekly Roundup. I am Ansar Stianis. Labor rights in Bangladesh has been an international concern, especially following tragic incidents that have led to the death of hundreds of workers. Labor struggles for safe working conditions and life with dignity have, however, been repeatedly quashed by the Bangladesh state with the use of lethal force. Minimum wage in the ready-made garment sector in Bangladesh is about 45 US dollars per month. Around 4 million workers, most of whom are women aged 20 to 35, struggle to survive on this wage, even though many work 72 hours a week, having to do so without appropriate nutritional intake. Apart from this, workers face numerous challenges in managing essential family expenses such as healthcare, education, and rent. Workers survive like bonded labor in Bangladesh's current employment crisis with few opportunities for a population of 160 million. Labor unrest provoked by inadequate wages and unsafe working environments is common in Bangladesh, as are brutal actions by law enforcement agencies against the struggling workers. The government has been reported to protect the interests of the ready-made garment traders and manufacturers without addressing the well-being of the laborers. No public institution has taken responsibility to protect labor rights in terms of job security, compensation, working hours, and working conditions, as well as in terms of basic human rights. The state's rule of lawlessness has paved the way for exploitation of workers by native and non-native companies. To discuss the labor rights issue in Bangladesh further, we have with us in the studio Muhammad Asafu Zaman, Program Officer of the HRC. Welcome Zaman. Thank you. Can you please explain why are labor rights concerns ignored by the Bangladesh government? There are several reasons for that. First, a lot of industrialists have been into politics in Bangladesh now. And uh, the political parties extort money from the industrialists and traders, businessmen, uh, a lot for their party expenditure and many other business. And uh, so for these two reasons, these people become influential because they get access to the powerful people, the heads of the states and heads of the government. At the same time, Many bureaucrats, civil bureaucrats, retired military officers, and sitting police officers, they also have business in Bangladesh. So all these people, they have quite a lot of power, administrative power, uh, and law enforcement agencies' power. So all this power is related to the political power and the exercise of power and by the state. So for these reasons, the workers' voice is not heard. They are always suppressed by the powerful segment of, of the country. So in this situation, what are the avenues that Bangladesh labor can pursue in order to protect their rights? The Bangladesh labor's first thing is that they have to unite it to pursue their uh, rights and uh, uh, they have to convey their message to the international communities and to the researchers. Also, the country-based civil society members, they should uh, play their responsibility to ensure the rights of the workers by doing non-biased, non-politicized research to protect the rights of the people because these working class people are the majority in the country. So if their rights are denied, the ultimately, the society's right and the entire nation's right will be denied. So that everybody needs to understand. 
if that understanding comes through and then the rights activists, uh, the workers' uh, leaders, they realize the necessity of protecting their rights without any political biasness and without any exaggeration or without violence, then there can be more attention from local and international groups to guarantee their rights. Okay, thank you very much for your insights, Silvan. In Sri Lanka, trade unions have also been continuously undermined since the crushing of the 1980 general strike when 40,000 striking workers were dismissed from their jobs. The police and military have been reported to use mob violence and direct attacks to crush demonstration by workers. The government has often sent supporters of the ruling party to sites of worker protests. This has led to open conflict as well as the arrest and persecution of trade union leaders. In recent years, the government has met protests by workers by sending in military and paramilitary forces, which have often fired. Amongst the examples of such state belligerents are the shootings of workers at Katunayaka Free Trade Zone, the killing of a fisherman in Negombo, and the killings of residents of Ratu Paswala who protested against the operation of a factory that has poisoned their water supply. Despite the promises made, the government has not conducted genuine inquiries into the shootings that have taken place. No one responsible for these shootings has been prosecuted. Many devious methods have been used to discourage the development of genuine trade unions in Sri Lanka. Leaders are often arrested and detained for long periods. There are severe restrictions on the meetings and communications of trade unions and labor organizations. This is aggravated by the general repression of journalists and free media within the country. And state media is constantly being used to disseminate false information and to blackmail opposition leaders and trade union leaders. Intelligence services regularly visit trade union office and civil society organizations and demand details of their activities in Sri Lanka. On the night of December 15, two bonded laborers, Nilambar Dangdamaji and Gyalu Nihal, had their hands chopped off by middlemen. The incident took place in the Kalahandi district of Odisha, India. The group of middlemen, led by Parma Raut, illegally confined them for almost a week before the incident. A group of 10 villagers informed the police they had each taken 10,000 rupees as advance from local middlemen to enable employment in the brick kilns of Raipur in the Indian state of Chhattisgarh. Dispersing such advance loans is a standard method used by middlemen to interrupt impoverished villagers and compel them to become bonded labor. Poor laborers in the Kalahandi Bolangir Kraput area of Odisha, where distressed migration is endemic, often have no choice but to fall into traps set by the middlemen. On their departure, however, the villagers realized that the middlemen were taking them to a different place. Horrified at what was in store, some of them escaped. Nilambar Dangdamaji and Gelunyal fell to get away and remained in custody of the middlemen. The middlemen began making ransom calls to families of the two men, pressurizing them to pay back the advance of 10,000 rupees each. The families reported the threat calls to the police who failed to act. In sense at the police complaint, Parmara allegedly took Nilambar and Gyalu to a deserted place, tortured them brutally, and chopped off their hands so they could never work again. The incident indicates that the practice of bonded labor and other forms of modern slavery are still prevalent in India. Government welfare seems like the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Act have failed to arrest the internal migration crisis in India, a failure the state has acknowledged as well. Over to Indonesia, Jeremy Belli, a Canadian activist, has recently met with Papuan political prisoners in Abipura prison Jayapura. Among other prisoners, he met with four Kuros Yubu Seimbut, Philip Karma, Selfius Bobby, Dominico Surabut, and Victor Yemo. According to Papuan Behind Bars, as of the end of November 2013, there were at least 71 political prisoners in Papuan jails. Jeremy's visit to the prison completed his Pedaling for Papua campaign, a 12,000 km international cycling and performance tour which aims to raise awareness on the ongoing human rights abuses in West Papua. Jeremy's visit to the prison was covered by several media in Indonesia, including the Jakarta Post, the Jakarta Globe, and Okazon News. Jeremy has claimed, however, that he and his campaign have been mischaracterized by Indonesian media. 
The Jakarta Post, Jakarta Globe, and Occasion News have reported Jeremy stating that the political prisoners are healthy and have no problems. I'm sure that officers in prison have treated them well. The media also wrote that Jeremy has said, it turned out that Papua is not like what I have heard. Speaking earlier to HRC, Jeremy explained that the prisoners were indeed in good spirit when he met them. He, however, said that the media were putting words into his mouth, as he never said that the prisoners are healthy and have no problems. Jeremy emphasized that the Papuan political prisoners were subjected to torture and regular isolation. Here is Jeremy speaking on his mischaracterization by the Indonesian media. Yeah, completely. It wasn't even a, it wasn't even a misquote. It was just a lie. Like it was it was just putting words in my mouth completely. So it was it was frustrating. It was actually kind of infuriating to be subjected to that kind of uh, propaganda. I, I essentially think that I that this campaign, which so many people have been working hard to make happen, and this action with which a lot of people have been working hard to make happen, had just been used for any again. So it was yes. The Supreme Court of India has criminalized homosexuality in the country. In its judgment in Suresh Kumar Kausal vs. Nas Foundation, the Supreme Court set aside a Delhi High Court order pronounced in 2009. The Indian Penal Code under Section 377 criminalizes homosexuality as unnatural sex between consenting adults. The Supreme Court held that Section 377, which holds same-sex relations unnatural, does not suffer from unconstitutionality. The judgment has shocked the LGBT community in India, who have termed it as a violation to the fundamental right to equality, as the section has been used to discriminate, harass, and intimidate the sexual minority in India. Section 377 was first incorporated into law in the 18th century, has no relevance in contemporary India. Earlier age, RC talked to Ritu Parnabura, an LGBT activist based in Delhi. So I don't know on what ground did they uh, op uh, over the, the uh, judgment. I think the ground that they gave was that 377 was not unconstitutional. It means anyone who wants to have anal sex or oral sex is criminal. The judgment is, should be entirely based on rights framework and should be based on the constitution. We were all horrified. And we did not expect this judgment at all. Uh, we felt that the judgment uh, was did not take into account uh, the struggles of queer people and also did not interpret what we uh, actually presented in the court. Um, we were very disappointed yesterday. We felt betrayed. We felt that living in a largest democracy, this shouldn't have happened. But I feel that uh, the struggle continues and it will continue continue till we achieve equality. That is all for this week's Human Rights Asia Weekly Roundup. For more information on these issues, log on to www.humanrights.asia. Thank you for watching and hope to see you again next week.